How did those guys ship this stuff that you sold? Did they put it in a container? Or oh, they, yeah, they put it yeah, in yeah, nine yeah. pallets and then a container. Yeah. They had a few customers that went on a ship. <coughs> it's already landed in Germany. John's going down there. I'm going to go with him and film it, and he's going to accept the Brilliant Institute. Brilliant. Then I had some previous uh, folks that were involved with me in 89. They're all intermingled there, and it's Dr. Ludwig who saw it. A year or two, a couple years prior to filming it, all these weird little like, things, they, they're quite interested in purchasing it. And, and some of John's original lab that didn't get seized by the Canadian government is in Germany or Austria, so we're going to go hunt that down, mm -hmm. as well as notes from Dr. Peter Kukoschnik. Peter Kukoschnik, right. My guess is none of that's any good unless John is playing it. Well, that's kind of, yeah. <laughs> They were, he'll, he'll set it up and he'll hook it up, but John knows the combination the harmonics is necessary. So and it's going to be real fun watching progress of that. Um, you might know, or heard this one and don't give a hoot about it, stop me. Mm -hmm. But they talked to me a little bit about helping with the theory. Well, I don't do theory, for one thing. Mm -hmm. And it's for sure that uh, they don't want to talk about paying me to do it. Who's they and... The Germans that Germans. purchased the thing. They, were, uh, oh, they the contacted guy, you. The guy first. that was boxing the stuff up. First, Dino. He was uh, at least writing an email every now and then about what could be done. But the guys that were supposed to be the power behind that uh, stayed behind that once I started to respond the way I did. Hmm. And that is, I know a lot about the field. I know the field that's really at the basis of this all. And... Uh, I'd be happy to teach you as much as I know about that. But I put it in certain phraseology that implied you're going to have to pay for the teaching. Right. And that right. really turns them off, I think. Right. Whatever. Wow. I don't care. It's, uh, Interesting stuff. Um, well, they're not getting a, a national anti-gravity event for the peanuts that they paid. They're getting the lab and John coming out there to hook it up. He might shake well, some things around. They're going to be very happy with that because they're basically museum curators when you get down to it. Right. If you look at the stuff that they have advertised and show, they're various classic machines. So John's going to be a classic machine. And I think he can go work smack bang probably for their challenge is very low, I guess 20 grams. You have a challenge to levitate Look. 20 grams with an inch or something like that for 10 minutes? Well, once you got the principle, it doesn't matter what the quantity is. Mm -hmm. 20 grams is great. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty reasonable amount that may be disruptive. We were having lunch yesterday. There's a bunch of bumblebees on the flop pot next to John. He was watching and I was watching him and a lot of people asked, you know, what I know about the anti-gravity and John said everything's frequency. You change the frequency and you change the gravity. And I looked at this bumblebee and each time they come on the flower, flower go down as he's in around in there and then the flower come back up with him on it, the bumblebee on it, and then he'd flap his wings and go fly away. What did the flower do? The flower would, the bee would come to the flower. Here's the bee, comes to the flower. It would go down. The flower drops down. Wings aren't flapping. Okay, wings are not flapping. Wings are not flapping. Wings are flapping. And the flower stayed in the same place. That's right. Amazing. So, so that bee was, I've always said that the, the, it changes its frequency. And the wings are just the rudder. Well, one thing you won't get out of me is a theory. You were bordering on offering a theory. You were just started at the outer shell of a theory offer. You would eventually build it into a theory. Many would. Uh, I can't get into it. Everything I do, I have to take out of measurements that I make. It doesn't matter a dang what other people say or do. Oddly enough, can't use it. It would be fascinating if there's some way you, we could have um, had some type of listening device on that bee and to see what its frequency was 
when it hit the when it hit the flower, and the flower drops down from the way the bee, and then if it changes as it comes back up, frequency. My guess is that it does, but we have to verify it. See, but the way I look at it is that that frequency really is only a minor part of a much more complex system if you're talking about interaction with gravity. So it's not the frequency only, it's the way it interacts with this, that, and the other dang thing. It's a total ensemble of events yeah. that, that does anything of value. And it's darn hard to find them all, I'll tell you. What hooks to what? It soon becomes just a question of connectivity, you know, coupling coefficients. Who, who owns this piece? Well, that's mine. No, it's not. It's mine, you know. And, and these kind of squabbles undoubtedly uh, have to occur in any complex process like that. So I just hear them and I get tired of hearing them because I can't do a thing about it. You know, politics is the same. I hear them jabbering politics left and right. I can't listen because I can't do anything. Without being able to be functional, the heck with it, you know. I'm wasting your time. So that's my opinion on lots of things. It goes right to the heart of what I work on. I don't read about things unless they bear on my business. I don't talk to people about things unless it bears on my business. I am selfish to the nth degree. What's your business? Getting at the root and the very thing that seems to propel John's work. I play the thing called EVOs. What is an EVO? An exotic vacuum object. It's a thing. Because you can certainly see it, fool with it, mess with it, make it do things, it does things for you. So it's a thing for sure, object. An exotic vacuum actually is a real world word. It's, it's a state of the universe, I'd call it, called the vacuum. Is uh, this substrate that everything is performed on in principle. You know, but now principle is theory. This is theory. And, and yeah bordering on it and I'm stopping but I wanted to introduce you to the interface that I have to to play with I can play with these things I can make them I can make all kinds of stuff and over the years very slowly I've been getting at the root of the stuff that John saw early on I haven't followed anything recently I don't think I could gain by it much because there was enough done very early on that I, I can still spend years on you know but I don't actually work on it. I just keep chugging down my path, and every now and then I say, oh, now I understand how that thing that John did could have happened. Like, on the subject of uh, gravity, I don't give a hoot about gravity, as long as there's a source of propulsion. Propulsion is a, as fundamental as you can get. It's controllable gravity directional control over whatever force you want. I'm sure if you could liken it to gravity, but I, I'll take propulsion any day. Yeah. Well, our, our bodies are continual propulsion, and I think we're, we actually We are, just have to be no, neutralized out pretty much. <laughs> well, right, but I mean, it went, otherwise we'd be blobs on the floor if we're not, if we didn't have such propulsion in our body. If you want to call that gravity, fine. I'll tell you, I can see the propulsion aspect of it. But we're also, we're not quite, we're not quite oh, right yeah. as far as our, this body isn't quite right for this gravity or this earth because we have knees that break down and backs that break down because of gravity. Mm, that's a biological failing in my book. Uh -huh. Gravity is a constant. It happens to bear on these machines. These machines are. that we are, right. And, uh, we're just not up to it that much of the time. So now we're getting into politics, almost. <laughs> Why do you think your bodies break down? Um, my opinion is that we are a, an evolved species. That in order to improve, we keep changing, keep testing, we keep evolving. Some examples win and go on and do better things in certain ways, worse than others, perhaps. It's not that my body 
it's bad. It's got a lot of good going on. But that little piece, that seemed to break. Never was quite right. It wasn't fixed from far enough back in time to uh, be evolved into the thing. It doesn't, until everybody's body breaks down, we have a uh, condition. We have a condition of uh, specialty failure, if you will. We just didn't evolve quite right. I, very interesting. I, I can't, uh, I'm not very happy with the system. Uh, you know, if you look at our prices that we pay for living long, it's huge. We'd be locked into this mess that we are. We are a mess. We're going to, in time, evolve into something better. But to get there, we're going to have to have failure after failure after failure. We'll be better in some ways, worse in others. But on the average, we'll move on. Like our hearing is bad, our smelling is bad. All of our nice animal features have been traded off for something else. Explain why you think that way. Why have our animal features been traded off? They're not necessary. And there are limited variations that we can afford to carry forward in our evolutionary process. We can't fix everything and move it all forward. Some stuff is left behind. So we left the animal things behind because they weren't necessary. We've, we've evolved a, a, a mental process, a thinking process. Uh, we are able to view a scene and make determinations about what's going to happen. Boy, that's pretty good. It's not exactly uh, what you call precognition, but it's darn useful. What about those that have precognition? Or not. I don't know. That's an argumentative field. I used to work in it. I did a lot of ESP type stuff. And I just got sick of it. hearing these stories people would tell. There was no way to back them up at all. They didn't. I uh, gave up the field and said until I feel a packet or it comes out with a meter. That's his psychic strength. You know, I'm out of it. But this is the work I'm doing is beginning to show me that there is something funny going on here. Because I can measure the funniest stuff you would ever want to hear about. Like what things do you measure? I measure the presence, if you will, measured in terms of total accumulated charge or total residual charge of this EVO. They vary. Well, nothing varies charge or mass. These things do. That is so fundamentally opposed to all natural laws that natural meaning and they have written down that uh, it's outrageous. We have a written rule law that says charge is conserved, mass is conserved, energy is conserved, E is equal to mc squared. They all hitched together. Wrong. Just dead wrong. Because I could take one of these little funny particles and change its charge. But an actual measurement, I mean, this is no hand-waving thing. Measure with an instrument, you can do it every day you want to. You can change it over a bit into one and still have it visible. The heck of it is, I can keep reducing the charge to where it becomes an item that walks right through things. That's how John's earliest work seemed to have stuff coming from the inside. He had been using a technique, similar to what I used, of injecting these chargeless particles into the core of the material. They use the metal in John's case. You can be fascinated with it. It doesn't much matter. Anything serves as a, as a uh, transport medium, if you will, for these things. Once they get in, they can transform themselves back into an energetic thing, just mean and nasty as can be by increasing the charge. And at that point, they come out mad. They have many pictures of John's stuff that I've got that shows them coming out. I never used to understand how they get in there. I understood what you do when you sling someone about the circle of a metal thing. There's an explosive mark. And these, these EVO straight marks are very common, but what wasn't common or unknown, totally unknown to me in those days, was how they can penetrate and get in. Finally one day it showed up. I was shooting through metal. Shouldn't be able to, tr to transmit that 
doesn't matter if the thing that's going through has no charge because its ability to transmit is a function of its charge like a neutron flies through all this stuff it doesn't see anything you don't even talk about space you know or forget the space between things even if it went straight to the core of this molecule it would go right on through because it doesn't have any charge which is the only interactive force that there is around that we know of. Well, that there is around means that, you know, that we know of. That we know of. <laughs> Interesting. No, I've been always fascinated with Ken's work and seeing the incredible photographs that you take of the EVOs. You know, my, my former partner there, George, is, I think he's on the wrong track with all this stuff. The photographs are really, really amazing to look at. EVO is something in a vacuum, an object in a vacuum. Okay. Exotic vacuum object. We were talking about what is the exotic vacuum, forgetting the gizmo, the object that I play with. There is a definition of the exotic vacuum. The vacuum, you realize, is a physics term. The vacuum is not a vacuum. It doesn't mean that you've removed all the molecules. It means it's the substrate that all our visible universe, all our active universe, is built upon the vacuum. And that's a theory. That's where it's the origin of the notion of zero-point energy. A theory. It is not measurable in many senses, but it is postulated as a theory. A virtue of the fact you have to have something for these things to reside on. Things, anything, any molecule, any atom, any particle, has to have a substrate. And the vacuum, in quotes, is the substrate. That's a hunk of theory that people have. I don't have to put up with it because I got a gadget. <laughs> it's so wild and so weird. Are you going to show us a gadget? Well, you have to go to pictures to see them because the gadget is shown through an instrument. An instrument uh, of a very different, different sort than usual. 